Hello guys. In the previous lecture, we introduced the basics of the Turing machines. And in this lecture, we continue our journey about knowing more about Turing machines. Let's uh, make some design by using our knowledge and the skills that we got so far. Yeah, this is the first example for designing. Before starting the design, I would like to mention some points here. We define accepting a string like other machines. I mean, uh, halting and consuming and being in final state. These guys will be equivalent to accepting the string. And also consuming this part, all symbols, is our responsibility as the designer and JFLAP does not help on this one. Also, we assume that if we want to implement this kind of machines, JFLAP is set to accept by final state. What does it mean? It means that if the flow of the string passes the final state, machine stops. For example, if we have something like this, and if a string flows after this accepting state, machine does not go through, and it stops here and will accept the string. So this is a, an important uh, point when we want to work with the JFLAB. I created the tutorial for this, and you may watch it. With this being said, uh, let's start our design. First, we need to enumerate this language, even though it's a very simple language, but it's a good habit that before we start designing, uh, we have some feelings that what kind of strings uh, we are going to accept. So since it starts from one, it will be A, 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 and so forth. Okay. The best practice for designing is to make a happy example, or let's say successful example, and design based on that. I put one of these strings here, let's say A, 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 and we know that the rest of them are filled with blank and please note that this blank is a reserve word and no string can contain this blank for example we don't have an input string let's say something like this here is how the machine starts and the cursor is pointing the first a i would say if the input is A, then we can change it to something else or we can delete it. Yeah, but delete it means that we can replace it with the blank or we can don't change it. For this particular example, yeah, we can just leave it as is and go to the right. My goal is to scan all of these and make sure that I have all A's here to reach this point. Okay, so after the first transition, I will reach here, and then the cursor goes here. So I need to do the same thing for the other A's. So I put a loop here, and I would say if it is A, then don't change it, go to the right. Okay, what would happen after this loop? All of these A's will be scanned, let's say. And uh, do you agree that the cursor goes here? And then if we are out of A, we would say if it is blank, then don't change it and go to the left or right, whatever. Yeah, This is my tradition that I would like to uh, keep the uh, string. So I would say here. All right, and then I can accept it. So this machine, we claim that it will accept all A's. Now let's check it if it starts with B. For example, if I feed B here, what would happen? So machine stops here. Do you agree that? If we say, for example, A, B, what would happen? It goes from A to here, and then since it is B, 
neither this nor this will be activated and machine stops here you can go over the other strings and make sure that this machine that we design uh, works fine one thing i want to mention here why did we start it from one if we start it from zero then what would happen then lambda goes here right and please note that we cannot make the initial state as the accepting state it doesn't work in turing machines if you want to use jflab if you make this as an accepting state then all the strings will be accepted right because we set the jflab accept by final state and when it reaches here everything will be accepted right okay so how can we handle lambda if we have lambda here yeah that's not a big deal actually uh, we may create a branch here and accept the lambdas here and if we, we would say if it is blank then don't change it let's say for example go to the right or left whatever yeah if we feed then lambda here then machine goes here instead of going that way and will be accepted here so all of the lambdas can be handled something like this plan so since this is the case we usually for the turing machine will eliminate the lambda because you know it has a constant solution our next example is our celebrity example a to the n b to the n again we started from one for this one we are already familiar with this and let's enumerate it a b a a b b and a a a b b b and so forth for understanding the design of this i would say you would need 150 percent attention what does it mean yeah you know solving this problem is a little bit more complicated than uh, whatever you have seen so far so you need to pay attention very carefully and follow me exactly uh, otherwise you will get lost very soon as usual we make a happy example let's say and the cursor is pointing to this the strategy is i read one a here and then i move to the right to find a matching b for this a so when i found this b then i return back to find another a and then i go to find another b for that and you see so forth it means that back and forth i find one a and then go to the right find a b and then go to the left find another a until we are out of a's and b's and if this is the case then the cursor reaches here and then i check whether it is blank and then i will accept the string but it is not so easy that i just explained uh, because first thing is when you move from here to find a b and when you reach here when you found this and when you return back how can you find the a's that you visited and the same thing is correct for the b's so it means that we need to mark them when we visit an a we change it to something and when we find a matching b for the a we mark it with something else for example if i visit a's i change it to x and when i found a matching b and i change it to y in this way we can make sure that which a's we visited and which b's are matched all right okay so with this being said now we are ready to start our design so we start from here and the first thing is yeah if it is a then change it to x 
go to right what would happen after this this is a it will be changed to x and go to the right so the cursor goes here all right now i need to find a matching b for this a so i need to bypass all of the a's how can i do that very easy i put a loop here and i would say if it is a don't change it go to the right after this loop what would happen yeah this guy and this guy will be bypassed and the cursor reaches here now if it is b mark it as or change it as let's say y and go to the left then this will be changed to y and it goes here okay so now i need to bypass all of the a's how can i do that very easy if it is a don't change it go to the left after this loop what would happen all of these a's will be bypassed until we reach an x here so this first x that we find it means that it was an a and it was visited already okay so how can i do that i put it here i would say if it is x then don't change it go to the right what do i expect to see here i expect to see when i go to the right i expect to see an a here okay so do you guys agree that this a we should do exactly the same thing that we did for the first a so i would suggest that we return it back to the beginning right because i expect that the same procedure happens for the next a but we need some modification let's trace and see what would happen okay so now the cursor is here and it is a yes change it to x go to the right bypass all of the a's okay if it is b oh it is not b yeah if it bypasses all of the a's then it reaches here so i need to bypass y's as well so no problem i put another label here i would say okay not only bypass a's also bypass y's and don't change them okay so i have two labels now on this loop whichever is satisfied that would be activated so all of the y's will be bypassed as well then machine reaches here and find a b and this guy will be activated change it to y okay no problem and then go to the left all right it is here now it says that bypass all of the a's but we don't have a now we are seeing y so we need to bypass y's as well if it is y don't change it go to the left fantastic okay so the y's will be bypassed by this guy the a's will be bypassed by this guy and we reach where here then what then it is x yes don't change it go to the right all right it goes here and we are here now right so the same thing would happen in this procedure so this a will be changed to x and then all of the y's will be bypassed by this guy and if it is b here yes change it to y and then go to the left right and then this loop is saying that bypass all of the y's then what would happen if it is x yes it is x after bypassing all of the uh, y's we reaches here and now we are here okay now what we are here and we are out of a's there is no a here right all of these are the x all right so it means that we need to jump out of this cycle how can we do that yeah we can create another branch here if it is y then 
don't change it go to the right what is the goal here because i want to make sure that all we have here is wise right and i need to reach to this blank to make sure that all of the a's and b's were equal so if it is y don't change it go to the right and i need to do the same thing on a loop it means that we are bypassing all of the y's and after this loop we assume that we are here okay and now i would say if it is blank then don't change it go to the left or right whatever and accept the string you see probably i was right that i warn you hey don't blink so you need very deep attention to understand what is happening and i am telling you that this is the key problem for understanding turing machine and how we handle that if you didn't understand that's fine no problem at all watch the video again and try to solve it on the paper by yourself and if you understand this then you will probably most likely let's say you will be able to solve any problem so this is the same solution i just reorganize it differently and i put the strategy here for your reference in this section uh, we are going to formally or mathematically define the turing machines so far we have learned that the transition function is the important part of the formal definition and most of other items are similar to other machines as we will see shortly here we have the transition functions of all machines that we have learned so far for comparison purpose and our goal is eventually to find out the syntax or the format of turing machines transition function we already know that the left side is the condition part and the right side of the sub rule is the operation part as an example let's look at this one which belongs to this dfa it means that if the machine is in q1 and the input is a yeah you see if the machine is in q1 and the input is a then go to q2 so on the right side we always have the operation maybe here uh, it's a better example if the machine is in q1 the input is a the top of the stack is x then go to q2 and push the y all of the operations is on the right side okay so the goal is to find out how we can respond to this question what is the right side of the turing machine and what is the syntax of the transition functions of the turing machines let me take an example and through the example we try to figure out all of these questions in this example we are going to find the sub rule of this transition as we said to form the left side we would need the set of q's so in fact we will see the q1 and the set of the input symbols so it means that i would need this and what would be the right side the right side is the state that machine uh, moves and the other operation is writing and the other operation is moving so i would need all of these three here okay with this being said we can figure out how the syntax look like so to form this order pair we would need q cross and how about this one it's this one is important yeah even though it's an input symbol but since the machine can change these symbols with other symbols that we call them the tape symbols then it is reasonable to put the gamma here 
which is the alphabet of the tape okay how about the right side this Q we would need the Q's which is the set of the states and cross this is again coming from the tape and for the movements we have L or R okay so we could figure out the syntax of the transition function so now we can fill out our table by this guy here we have another uh, exercise I ask you guys to find out the, all of the uh, sub rules of this Turing machine uh, which is uh, easy so Q 0 B we are starting from here then on the right side we would have go to Q1 and write the B and move to the left you can figure out the rest of that and here is the solution before going further I would like to mention something here let's try to find out Q1 and A do we have any outgoing transition for the A no we don't have so what would be the range of this value definitely undefined why did I mention this here because I want to show you that this function is a partial function of course it can be total function if we have all of the transitions that we require but you know at least one undefined make this, this function as partial function as you know okay now we are ready for our formal definitions so a standard Turing machine which is a deterministic one can be defined by a septuple or seven tuple and most of them are familiar the Q the uh, Sigma Q0 and the F just just repeat and even we are familiar with the gamma which is the tape alphabet we had this for the PDAs uh, that was for the stack alphabet and we will be using the same concept and we just figured out the syntax of the delta function or transition function and we learned that it can be total or partial and also we need to introduce this blank as a member of the, the symbols of the tape or alphabets of the tape that we call it uh, as gamma and definitely it's a reserve symbol it means that it cannot be part of the sigma here we just have for reviewing what we learned now let me give you some notes we have this relationship between the sigma gamma and this guy that is we call this blank symbol so why is this a true statement because uh, we know that this guy is always a subset of the alphabet of the tape but since Sigma cannot contain the blank we need to remove it from here otherwise it would be some part of the subset for this guy this is the relationship between the Sigma and Gamma another point I would like to mention here there is no relationship between the determinism and the type of the function total function or partial function this can be source of some confusion for some students but I want to say that there is absolutely no relationship between these two here are some examples DFA is total and it is deterministic on the other hand Turing machine is partial or total and it is deterministic too and we have the same thing for the DPDAs it can be partial and it is deterministic so bottom line there is no relationship between determinism and the type of the function I mean being total or partial now let's compare Turing machines and PDAs and 
obviously the goal of this section is finding out which one is more powerful we would need to ask two questions can turing machines simulate pdas can pda simulate turing machines so let's start with the first question can turing machines simulate pdas let's assume we construct a pda for an arbitrary language like l so we have a language l here and we created the pda for that is this the case that always we can create a turing machine for the same language if we say yes then it means that whatever the pdas can do Turing machines can do as well. So how can we do that? So far, we had a technique that we could convert the formal definitions of one machine to another machine. To refresh your mind, let me remind you what we did for converting the NFAs to NPDAs. So if this is an NFA, we use the simple algorithm to convert the formal definition of the transition function and other items to the NPDAs. How could we do that? Yeah, very simple. We just add a comma lambda here, comma lambda here. And also we did these transformations. For the Qs, no changes. For the alphabet, no changes. We just needed to add this and as i said this comma lambda no changes here and we added this z to this definition and this way easily we converted the nfa's mathematical definition to npda's mathematical definition so this is something that we did so far but can we do that for the turing machines and PDAs? Probably not. Because as you see, the syntax of the definition for the PDAs and for the Turing machines are different, right? So we cannot use that technique. Then what can we do? Yeah, we need to do the real simulation. What does it mean? Let's assume that we have a language let's call it L, and then we have a PDA for that. So this is a PDA, let's call it M. Now the question is, can we simulate this PDA and convert it to another machine, let's call it M prime, and this guy is Turing machine, all right? So this is the important question. M, or our PDA, has some transitions. And we need to simulate all of those transitions by Turing machines. What does it mean? Let, let me take an example and explain everything through this example. So, for example, this is an PDA, right? And there are some transitions like this, like this, like this. If I want to convert this machine to Turing machine, it means that I need to simulate all of the, these transitions to Turing machine transition. How can I do that? Okay, so this is the logical question. All right, let me show you all of the possible transitions that PDA can have. So this is one of them. If the input is B in if the top of the stack is X, then consume this and then pop this and push this, whatever it is. The W can be a, a string. This is one general type of the PDA's transition, but this is not the only one. We have several other things. For example, if we can put Lambda here, or yeah, we can put Lambda in other places and these eight transitions are all possible transitions so if i can simulate all of these eight types 
to Turing machines transitions, then I would be able to convert all of the PDAs to Turing machines. So this is called a real simulation, right? We are not gonna change the mathematical definitions. We are gonna really simulate all of the transitions. Okay, so to show you that this is a doable, I did this and I put the document here. You may refer to that. And I just did for the first one, which is the simplest one, and I left the rest of them for exercise. Now let's ask the other questions. Can PDAs simulate Turing machines? So in fact, we have a Turing machine for a language. Now we are asking whether we can convert this Turing machine to a PDA. Yeah, absolutely not. And the reason is, I think, obvious, because then we need to simulate the read-write tape with a stack, and it is impossible, right? And I can prove this by at least two counter examples. This is an example that we could not construct a PDA for that, or this is another one. But for both of them, we can create Turing machines. Okay, now with all of these being said, let's summarize our knowledge and figure out that what would be the next step. So far, we learned that this is the relationship between the machines and the formal languages. So NFAs and DFAs just recognize the regular languages. PDAs recognize context-free, and we just learned that Turing machine can recognize a bigger portion of the formal language that we will see later that the, this uh, we call this portion as Turing recognizable languages. If this is the case, as you see, the portion that will be recognized by Turing machine is a superset for the portion of the languages that can be recognized by PDAs. That's why we say Turing machines are more powerful than PDAs. Yeah, let me very quickly define the Turing recognizable languages. A language is called Turing recognizable if there exists a Turing machine to recognize it. So what would be the next step? Yeah, probably there are some languages here and it is reasonable that we look for them. But first we need to find one of them, what languages are they? And then try to look for a new class of machines for recognizing them. In this section, we want to review the basic concepts of computation. The first one is the meaning of the algorithm. What is algorithm? Algorithm for a problem that we now know that problem is equivalent to a formal language. So the algorithm for a problem is equivalent to design a Turing machine to solve it. And we already know that solving a problem means to accept the formal language or recognize it. So in other words, when we create a transition graph for a formal language, in fact, we are creating the algorithm. The next concept is the meaning of program for Turing machine. When we have a subrule for a Turing machine, what does it mean? It means that how machine make a decision to go or not to go from one state to another state. And we have learned that for every transition, we have, in fact, an if-then statement. So can we consider a subrule as a one-line program? Yes, it is one-line program. If we have a transition function, which is a set of the, these if-thens or a set of the subrules, the entire transition function can be called 
the program of the Turing machine. What is program? It is the transition function of a Turing machine. What is the syntax? The syntax will be specified by the delta function, right? So for example, for Turing machine, we specified this syntax. And here is an example. So all of the program statements looks like this, right? And if we just translate it, it into the pseudocode, we can say if you are in Q2 and in the input symbol is B, then transit to Q5 and replace the B with K and go to the left. In this section, we are going to add a cool option to the standard Turing machine. What does it mean? So far, we know that the standard Turing machine, the cursor can move left or right. Now we want to add another movement, which is called stay or no movement. And it is denoted by S. Everything else remains exactly the same. All right. Let me take an example and explain it through this example. This is a transition containing uh, the S or stay option. It looks like a regular one, but the only difference is this guy. Up to this point, we know what does it mean. It means that if the input is B, change it to K. And here, we just instead of going left or right, we would say stay. So if this is the content of the tape, then after this transition, as you see, the B is changed to K, but the cursor stays put. To use this option in JFLAB, we need to activate it in the preferences. How can we do that? Here is the menu that we need to check. Allow stay for tape head on transition. Okay. The next question is, if we add this option, is there any changes on the formal definition? Yeah, very really small changes. We have here the set of the movement symbols, L and R. We just need to add S as well. Okay, so from now on, we can use this stay option. Let me ask a very important question that is really worth $1 million. Let's assume that this is a Turing machine and it is working, 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 working for a long time. Now the question is, how can I figure out that it is in the middle of a very long computation or it is in an infinite loop? Okay, should I wait? Can I prove that this machine is in a long computation or can I prove that this Turing machine is really in an infinite loop? Okay, let me formulate this question in computer science terminology. I am looking for an algorithm like this, whose input is the definition of a Turing machine and a string. You might ask, well, how can I input a Turing machine? into this algorithm, we can encode everything, right? So this Turing machine has a definition. It has a mathematical definition. I can encode those mathematical definitions and input it to this algorithm. We can encode this uh, string as well, all right? So we are looking for an algorithm like this, whose input is two items, a Turing machine and a string, and we expect this algorithm tells us that it is in a long computation or it is in an infinite loop. So can we create such algorithm? Or in other words, is this a solvable problem? As we will see later, this question was asked and responded by Alan Turing in 1936. So we will get back to this question later. Okay. I'm going to stop here. See you guys in the next video.